Uh, testing. Oh, good. My international sign for I'm ready worked. That's good. <coughs> um, <coughs> so first off, I do apologize in advance. I'm going to be downing as much caffeine as I possibly can. I only flew in last night, and I'm still on London time. Um, because of the jet lag, this could be a very interesting talk. <coughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming here today to talk about supporting characters and subplots. Uh, my name is Tony Lee, and before we start, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions. Uh, I did hear a lot of whooping next door, which now means that you are now their rivals and we must do better. But what I want to do is I just want to get a vague idea by noise, because I'm jet lagged and can't see hands go up in the room this big. Uh, give, make a noise if you've not yet published a book. Okay, good, good, good. Oh no, I might be changing your minds and making things bad. Um, make a noise if you have released your first book, but you're now working on your difficult second album. Okay, good. Uh, make a noise if you have released several books, but you're here just to get a bit of a, a touch up and work out a bit more going on. Good. And make a noise if you are a seven figure author and you're in the wrong talk. <laughs> Stephanie Hudson, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you so much for coming. I will make another apology right now as well. Uh, my name is Tony Lee, as I said. I'm British. That's not why I'm apologizing, although we're rapidly reaching that point. Um, I'm actually apologizing because I come from London and I talk quite fast. And this is quite an intensive craft talk. It's not one of these ones where I do 10 minutes of pictures and then we have questions. It's, there's a lot packed in. I do talk quite fast. If you don't understand me, I do apologize. We will hopefully have time at the end for you to go, what the hell did you just say? Um, but don't worry, because this is being recorded. This will be on YouTube, and they do have captions. So you will also be able to understand what I'm saying. However, having recently just done a podcast with Joe Solari and realizing that half the time it thought I said the word elephants, I'm not sure. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> Um, so yes, uh, obviously thank you for coming here today. Uh, my name is Tony Lee. Um, the first thing that people often ask when I turn up is who are you, which I absolutely get. This is my first 20 Books Vegas. Uh, it's my second 20 Books conference in total. I did Madrid in June. I've actually only been a member of the group for just over two years. Uh, so, <clears throat> but I've actually been a writer for over 35 years now. Uh, I started writing as a teenager, doing games reviews. Uh, I'm a New York Times best-selling author. I'm a multiple times New York Times best-selling author uh, of traditional publishing. I've worked in comics, uh, graphic novels, film, TV, uh, pretty much for most of these people, in fact, all of these people over the time. But that's not why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. <That's laughs> but that's not why I'm here. The reason I'm here is because for the last two years, uh, I've been writing as Jack Gatland, uh, doing a series of thriller books and crime novels and things like that. And to be, give you an idea, the top left one, Letter from the Dead, came out exactly two years ago today. So that gives you an idea of how long I've been doing this. I've released, thank you, uh, I've released 16 books in total. I've been working on a rapid release. Um, I've been uh, aiming at writing to market. And in those two years, I have had, as of today, 90 million uh, page views on Kindle Limited, I've done over 100,000 sales, I've had over 20,000 five-star reviews, I'm not mentioning how many one-star reviews, um, and yeah, quite, quite a lot on that. But I want to point out that I'm not saying this, I'm, I'm, and I'm a mid-six-figure author, but I'm not, I'm not saying this because I want you to go, oh, wow, well, look at him. I'm saying this because I'm doing all this. And in two years, uh, I started during the pandemic. Writing was really shit for people who were writing traditional media in comics and TV and film. I worked into this because of desperation. I needed to find a way that I could carry on writing and creating my own way. And after two years and this many books, I can't believe that I'm here even talking about these because I can't write books. Now, that might sound like an interesting thing for somebody standing on stage to say, but it's true. I am a massive fan of reading books. I've, ever since I was a kid, I've been voraciously reading books, and I love nothing better than a book that gives an amazing uh, description of a location or a scene, something that I can believe that I'm actually there. But I can't write that. 
I'm not good enough in prose to write that because for 30 years I've worked in other medias. I've worked in film and TV where if I write a scene, I don't have to write the scene, the director will create the scene for me. I've written in comics and, and graphic novels and again, I don't have to write the scene. I will give it to the artist and the artist will draw the scene that I've described. Sometimes they'll send death threats, but it doesn't matter. I don't have to worry about it, but now, as a prose writer, I have to write these things. And the first thing I realized when I started writing books, after a very long break uh, since I did it many, many years ago, was that my books were coming in incredibly short because I wasn't doing the page upon page of descriptions I needed, and I realized I had to do something else. I took from my knowledge of film and TV, of my knowledge of comics, and started adding more bang for the buck. I added more characters, I added more subplots. I wanted to find a way to make people say, I couldn't put this book down because they literally, from one page to the next, it would change. And I do, this is how I work. In fact, one of the questions um, I was asked before I did Madrid was, do you have to be a plotter to use subplots? And the answer is yes and no. Because you can, I mean, and I don't, I'm not gonna do a hands here because there's, everybody is in different ways because a lot of people like to be the deeply plotted writer. They like to be the person who has the entire story is worked out in advance, they know what they're doing, they can plan it all out and then they write and it's the easiest thing in the world and I hate those people. <laughs> I think they should burn. But I was one of them in comics, because in comics the real estate is different. In comics, when you start a comic, you're told your page count before you start, so you have to write the story, break it into scenes, break those scenes into pages, those pages into panel. So I get that. And that's fine if that's how you work. But then there's the other type, the discovery writer. That makes you sound exciting. I'm a discovery writer. As I write my story, I discover how it works. I'm an organic writer. As I write my story, the world comes to me and tells me what my story is. I can see people go, yep. <laughs> We're also known as the flying by the seats of our pants writer or pantser. And again, a lot of people will start their book with no idea what's going on and they will carry on until the very end and somehow, magically, they've created a book. And brilliant, well done. I hate you too and you can also burn because I tried that with some of my books, and when you're writing a murder mystery and you work it all out and it's great and you've got a killer and they've killed someone, and by 50,000 words into the book you've realized you've murdered them, <laughs> you have to change the way you write. And this is why I'm here today. So, part of what I do in this talk is actually talk about stuff I'm talking about tomorrow in my Chekhov's Gun and How Not to Shoot Yourself. So I'm going to try not to double up too much. But what I want to talk about is how most people, when they're pantsing, don't just start with once upon a time. They will know a moment in their book. There'll be a scene that they already have that they know they want to get to. Uh, and for ease, I'm going to use Robin Hood as, as mine just here, because Robin Hood's one of those characters that everybody can go, I know Robin Hood. But the chances are, the legend of Robin Hood you know is completely different to the legend of Robin Hood the person next to you it knows. I'm a, a Robin Hood scholar. I've been reading them since I was a kid. I've been to the places where Robin Hood was, the, the real Robin Hood was supposed to have been. None of them are in Nottingham. You know, uh, Marion didn't turn up until the 16th century. He wasn't even with King Richard until Victorian times. The story keeps changing, but it doesn't matter. Because if you know the story of Robin Hood, you will know there's Robin Hood, there's Maid Marion, and there's the Sheriff of Nottingham. And depending on which Robin Hood you know, the main character and the supporting characters are completely different. Mainly, Robin Hood is your main character. Recently, we've had movies and books with Maid Marian as the main character. Russell Crowe was supposed to have done a, a film called Nottingham, where the sheriff was the main character. They turned it into the one he did with, where he was Robin Hood, and I still think he should have done the original, because it would have been different from what it was. But either way, that legend already has a main character and two supporting characters. Now, if I was to turn around and pick an exciting scene from that moment, I might pick a scene where, say, Maid Marion is about to be executed. The Sheriff of Nottingham is standing there in his courtyard and he's going, moo ha ha, kill her. And Maid Marion's going, you don't want to do this, you'll be sorry. And she's not scared because she knows that up there Robin Hood is with a bow and arrow. 
because that's the kind of scene we expect from this story. And if I was to say to somebody, you know, where do you see it? It'd probably be almost near the end, towards the final Act 3 big finale fight, where everyone turns up and some random Scottish actor turns up to play Richard the Lionheart at the end. <laughs> but at the same time, everybody kind of knows what's going to happen. But if you don't know the story of Robin Hood, well, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you've got these three people here, but we know nothing about them. The sheriff of Nottingham, well, he has the word sheriff. If you like westerns, you're going to instantly think he's the good guy. This woman here, standing here going, you don't want to do this, you'll be sorry, you've walked into a scene where she's being hanged. She could deserve it, we don't know. She could be a serial killer, she could eat puppies for breakfast, we do not know. And there's a guy up there with a bow and arrow, he could be here to shoot her in the face, we do not know. So we need to look at this first and decide why these people are there. What are their characters? Why are these people getting to this moment in time? And this is one of the reasons why this talk is quite intense, is because to talk about supporting characters and subplots, I also have to talk about characters and plots, because you need to understand the basics before you move to the middle bit. And so what I'd like to just start off is to talk about characters. Who is the character and why do we really care about that character? How do you get an audience to like that character? Now, a lot of people in prose can quite easily spend an entire book doing an origin of a character so that by the end of the book, your audience love them. But that doesn't work anymore. We're now in a world where people have Kindle Unlimited and they can just flick a book on, check 20 pages and not read it anymore. They can check it on Amazon themselves. You need to work fast. If you have an anti-hero who generally by the end of it is the hero, you need to find a way to make the audience fall in love with them even quicker. Now, for this, I'm stealing from films and TV. And before I do this, I just want to ask, uh, make a noise, uh, again, because I've got light shining into me and I'm jet lagged, uh, if you have worked in film and television. Okay, good. So some of you might know this phrase. It's called Save the Cat. And Save the Cat is a shorthand term created uh, in the industry. It's, there's a book written about it by Blake Snyder on how to very quickly make the audience like a character. Salespeople will turn around to you and say, when you meet someone for the first time, you will decide within 20 seconds of meeting them whether you like them or you think they're a prick. To be perfectly honest, you've already made your decision about me. It's as simple as that. However, there are ways to change that. Salespeople, when they meet you for the first time, will instantly try to disarm you because they want to move past that 20 seconds. So Save the Cat is where a character gets the audience to like them by doing a small good deed. So basically, um, yeah, they're, they're an evil character, yet they save a cat. So you're instantly thinking, oh, well, he's a bit of a douchebag, but he saved that cat, so he can't be all bad. Uh, to give you an idea, well, I've got one head. To give you an idea here, uh, Aladdin, Disney's Aladdin, yeah? At the very first scene of Disney's Aladdin, Aladdin is being chased by the Caliph's guards. He's got a big song and dance number, it's very exciting, and he's running around, he's stolen a loaf of bread. If you look at it on paper, Aladdin's a bad guy. He's stolen and he's being chased by the police. If you look at it in other ways, you could actually make him the villain of the story. How do you save the cat? Because the moment he escapes, he sees two orphan kids, he gives them the food. Instantly at that point, you learn two things about him. One, he's a nice guy. Two, he didn't give a damn about the bread. He's a thrill seeker. He enjoyed leading the Caliph's men on a dance. And that characterization follows him throughout the film. You can also have Save the Cat by Proxy. Now, Save the Cat by Proxy is when a character is liked by the audience due to the opinions of a friend or the narrator. And it's the same way that if you meet someone and you don't really like them, but your best mate thinks they're brilliant, there's a part of you that might give them a second chance. You'll give them the benefit of the doubt because somebody you trust likes that person. And it's the same in books and in film and TV, etc. If you found yourself having a link with a character in that story and that character vouches for someone else, you will subconsciously like that other person. Very nice, quick way of doing it. But then you could go the other way. Kill the dog. Kill the dog is, uh, that's not an order, by the way. YouTube, that don't demonetize me. When a character gets the audience to dislike them by doing a small, evil deed. If somebody does something bad, you instantly start to dislike them. And it's called Kill the Dog because dogs are innocent. 
And any time you see somebody do something bad to an innocent animal or creature or something like that, you instantly turn against them. And then you also have kill the dog by proxy, when an unlikable character is hated by an even more hated and unlikable character. Now, these two can also kind of fall into situations where they mix with each other. Kill the dog, for example, is used in John Wick. If you've seen the John Wick movies, John Wick is Keanu Reeves, and you instantly like him because he's Keanu Reeves. But John Wick himself, he's, he's an assassin. He's the Baba Yaga of assassins. He's so hated and feared that everybody worries about him. So he was not a nice guy. He murdered and murdered and murdered and murdered, and you're supposed to like him. And the way they do it is the bad guy steals his car. Couldn't give a shit. But then he also kills his puppy. And now, I don't know about you, but anybody I know who's seen that film, the moment that puppy dies and John Wick decides to get revenge, they're standing behind him going, kill those bastards now! I am with you, John, until the very end. <laughs> and it's true. And, and it's the same with an unlikable character being hated by an even more one. This is very much a trope from wrestling. If you watch WWE or AEW or something like that, these guys have to have a weekly story, no matter what, because it's constantly going on. And they have people doing this who can often get injured. It's very easy for a wrestler to pull a, a muscle or tear an ACL or break a, a, an arm or something like that. And if your top babyface character gets injured, they have to instantly slot somebody else in. And if they find that their top next person is a bad guy, they, they instantly have to make that character a good guy. And nine times out of ten, a worse bad guy beats them up. And then they're getting revenge, and like John Wick, you're on their side. It's also the same as things like Darth Vader in Star Wars. Darth Vader in Star Wars is the bad guy. And that was fine, because George Lucas only had one film. But when he started doing sequels, he realized he wanted to humanize Vader. He wanted to get to a point where Vader could redeem himself, and so he made him middle management. He brought the Empire in above him, and the Empire was a bigger dick. And people started to feel sorry for Vader. And that's, again, a way to mild this up. When creating a character, do not do cliches. Cliches in supporting characters. Characters, make your character different. How is your character different? Here are five actors and characters from film and TV. Um, I don't know if you can see them very well, but uh, from the left onwards, can someone tell me who the person in the first picture is? Just shout it out. Tom Cruise playing Ethan, Ethan Hunt. Thank you. Second one, Jason Bourne played by... Matt Damon. Third one. Captain America or Steve Rogers, played by Chris, Chris Evans. Next one. Katniss Everdeen, played by Jennifer Lawrence. And finally, Liam Neeson, playing Liam Neeson. <laughs> yes. Usually I get that guy from Taken. Because that's what you know. It's Liam Neeson playing the guy from Taken. He's done three Taken movies. No, this is Liam Neeson playing the guy from A Walk Among the Tombstones, one of the many movies where Liam Neeson has played Liam Neeson over the last 20 years. And in fact, it's got to the point now that if Liam Neeson is doing an action movie, it's the same as these. We have Taken, Taken 2, Taken 3, Taken on a plane, Taken on a train, Taken in the night, Taken in the cold, Taken with amnesia. It doesn't matter. Don't do it. Don't do it. Make your character suffer. Everybody loves a Game of Thrones wedding. Everybody likes that point where your character has to fight against the odds because everybody likes a scrappy underdog. Do not give your character everything from the start because then it becomes boring. But more importantly, give them secrets and desires. What does your character want and what do they want to hide? And this is a thing that a lot of people forget because characters if they don't have this side to them, that angle, well, then that becomes a boring part of their life. It becomes a thread that they can't use. Every one of you in this room has something that you probably don't want everybody else in this room to know. It's as simple as that. It could be small, it could be large. If it's very large, go seek help. But all of you will have something in your past that you will know. That is your secrets and desires. And when you're looking at this sort of thing, you need to look at your character, because there are three strands to a character. First off, you'll have your professional side of a character. 
This is the job that needs to be done. It's defeat the monster and save the village. It's uh, solve the crime, arrest the culprit, uh, for, follow the map and locate the treasure. It doesn't matter what it is, this is your task. So Luke Skywalker, for example, his professional side is to send this droid to Alderaan, and then it's to save the princess, and then it's to defeat the Death Star. It doesn't matter that they're changing, but there will always be the professional reason why they're moving on. Then you have your personal, and this is the needs of the character. And it's going to be thrown into two types. Usually it's your psychological need, which is a flaw that doesn't really hurt anybody. And then you have your moral need. And the moral need is a flaw that can affect other characters. So for example, psychological need is my character is an introvert. Uh, moral need, my character is an alcoholic. Two things that can be used for your characters, but by the end of your story, there has to be a resolution and understanding of both of them. Usually you'll find that if you have an introverted character, by the end of the story, they're the one that has to do the big speech or something like that. You don't have to do that, that's a bit on the nose, but you still have to have a resolution or at least understanding. Your alcoholic might not have quit drinking by the end, but they might have accepted they're an alcoholic. They might have classed themselves as a functional alcoholic. It doesn't matter, they have to accept that. So again, with the personal side, Luke Skywalker, well, he kind of wants to be like his dad. He's heard his dad was a great pilot. He wants to be a great pilot. He's heard his dad was this mystical wizard with a light stick. That sounds great. He wants to do that. That's his personal need. It's moving away from his professional side. And then you have the private side. What the character wants for themselves. Self-sacrificing characters are boring. You want them to have jealousy and a forbidden love. You want them to keep their secrets safe and sound. You want your character, as they're going through the story, to maybe have points where somebody there might know something about them that they don't want others to know. Give them that trepidation. Again, with Luke Skywalker, well, his personal side is when he sees this and wants to go and help the princess, it's because he finds her pretty. We don't go on about the sister bit yet. That's a different film, but... And he sees her, he thinks, she's pretty, I want to save her. He's so desperate to get off his planet, he will do anything. And here's the thing. In Star Wars, at the beginning, Uncle Owen says to him, you can't go to the Academy this year. You've got to stay another year and help me. And he's like, oh, but Uncle Owen, I want to go here. And he's really whining. But in the deleted scenes where he sees his friend, Wed, uh, where he sees his friend Biggs, you realize the Academy is the Imperial Academy. Because Biggs is leaving it to go be a rebellion uh, fighter. So Luke is so desperate to join the Imperial Army to get off Tatooine, he'll do anything. So that's his secret side, because I'm sure if you're the hero of the rebellion, you don't really want that known. Also, that you fancy your sister. So let's go into supporting characters. Avoid cliches, because your supporting characters are the same as your main characters. Every rule you have for a character should be there for your supporting character. Give your supporting character an independent goal. They are not there just to go, wow, jeepers, that's brilliant, we should do this. Give them something, make it contrasting. That's always fun. Make your supporting character something that is relevant to the story. Some stories will actually have it that the supporting character is the everyman character, the person that the audience can learn the story through. Doctor Who, the main character in Doctor Who isn't the Doctor, it's the companion. The Doctor's this weird space alien who keeps changing, but the companion's the one from Peckham or somewhere else, usually in London or Wales, that's going, gosh, Doctor, who are these strange people with the bumps? And then he explains it and the audience gets to see it. Focus on their speech patterns. One of the biggest issues I see in everything is you are, I don't know, say a white middle-class author, your characters all sound like white middle-class characters. You have to look at the speech patterns. Here are five actors. Three Toms, a Jason, and a Rock. <laughs> now imagine these five people saying the line, thanks so much for cooking dinner, I really appreciate it. Now, Tom Hanks would probably say it the same way. It, you know, it's quite polite, it's quite generic, it's quite good. Tom Cruise would probably say it with a bit of a <laughs> smile, or maybe a bit of a run, we don't know. Jason Momoa would not say that line. Jason Momoa would probably start with, oh, my man, or something. Tom Hardy, you wouldn't understand. And The Rock would just powerbomb you through a table, but it doesn't matter, because every single one of those people 
would say that differently. So when you're writing a character, I often suggest cast it. Dream cast your character. You don't have to ever think, when the movie's made, it'll be this guy. It could be somebody who's been dead for years. It doesn't matter. But if you have that idea, that person and the way they talk and their mannerisms in your head, you will write them onto the page. And it's the simplest thing that so many people just kind of move past and allow them to represent some aspect of the story. Are they your main character's conscience? Are they your main character's guilt? It doesn't matter what it is. Give them something that they can use. And again, professional, personal, and private. And with sub-characters, there's also, these all have them as well, because Ben Kenobi in Star Wars, well, we've already mentioned how Luke is a bit of a prick, so let's look at Ben. Ben Kenobi, his professionalism is he's asked by a friend of his father's, someone we now know he knew as a child, to come along and do this particular thing. He's brought by a sense of justice to do this. But at the same time, personally, he has guilt. He has guilt that he's been staying away from the fight and he could have helped them. And privately, well, he killed his dad. Well, left him to burn on a, on a, on a planet of lava. He's got a ton of guilt that he hasn't told his son yet. He's telling Luke, oh, your father was a lovely man until Darth Vader killed him. <coughs> well, we all know with hindsight that's not what happened, but that's Ben Kenobi's private side. He doesn't want Luke to learn that Darth Vader is his father. And that's why when we get to Return of the Jedi, the conversation is such an important one. But when we're talking about sub-characters and supporting characters and stuff like that, we do have to talk about the joys of being a villain. Because villains are supporting characters. And more importantly, villains... No villain in any good story believes they're the villain of the story. Every good villain believes they're doing the right thing. Every good villain believes that what they are doing is for the valid reasons. Lex Luthor is a villain. He hates Superman. But he hates Superman because Superman is an alien, has appeared out of nowhere, is being deified by the people of Metropolis, and he could just bring more of his alien race at any time and subvert mankind. So therefore, as far as, Luke, uh, as Lex Luthor is concerned, he's saving the world by defeating Superman. Here are ten of the top villains of all time, according to IMDb. Darth Vader. Well, we've already talked about him. He's middle management. He's somebody whose situation has led him to this. He's been corrupted. He's kind of like, you know, someone who's joined a cult. He's, he's, he's a bit confused, but at the end of the time, he can redeem himself. But he's not villainous for villainous sake. He's doing this because of the situation. His wife has died and things like that. The Joker, it's the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, who is a creation of society. Uh, Loki, well, depending on which time you're watching any of the MCU, he's a hero or a villain, but he's also a character that his entire life believed he was a, a son of Asgard and then learned he was adopted and was lied to. Hans Gruber is not a terrorist. He's a Christmas bank robber. Khan is a victim. In the wrath of Khan, Khan is not the enemy. Khan was taken many decades ago and dumped on this planet that turned into a wasteland. His wife was murdered by the Federation because of this. He's a victim. He's not a bad guy. Hans Lauder from uh, Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, he's a bad guy. <laughs> but his badness is because he's ambitious. He's found a way to become the best Nazi he possibly can, which is not a good thing, kids. But that's why he does what he does. Kylo Ren. Well... Basically, he woke up when he was a teenager, and Luke Skywalker was trying to kill him with a lightsaber. That will do it. Voldemort is the equivalent of a magical white supremacist. He believes that his race, his type, is better than the others. He's convinced himself that way. But at the same time, he's not being a villain for villain's sake. He believes he's helping everybody. Gollum is a drug addict. <laughs> Simple as that. And Pennywise is an alien, and therefore doesn't matter. So let's look at subplots. And yes, Inegi Montoya, hello, you killed my father, prepare to die, is one of my favorite subplots of the entire universe. A subplot is a side story that always runs parallel to the main story's plot. It is a secondary strand of characters and events, all of which infuse important information into the main storyline. Sometimes that information might not be relevant. It might be there purely to draw you in a different direction. Red herrings, things like that. But nine times out of ten, it's something that runs alongside the story that you don't really realise there's any reference to the tale until two-thirds of the way through, where suddenly you realise it meant everything. 
For example, House MD, um, a great medical drama, a very loose adaptation of Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Every, si absolutely, every single episode, there would be two stories happening. You'd have your main big illness that had to be done, and some random subplot involving either another person who was ill or something else that was going on in Gregory House's life. It didn't matter what it was. But without fail, 10 minutes before the end of the episode, the resolution of that subplot would show him what the problem was with the main plot. The illness or something that he realizes here gives him the answer to the illness that is happening there. That's a subplot. It's as simple as that. But it could also be opposing stories, because there are three sides to every story. His, hers, and the truth. Because you, if you're telling your side of a story, will always be your side of the story. You can't be an unbiased narrator, because you're talking about your own side of it. Which is why sometimes un unstable narrators are brilliant, because if you're an unreliable storyteller, then you're not too sure if the truth's even being told at this point. Subplots will add depth to the story. S simple as that. It gives you more bang for the buck. It gives you more things that go on. And if you're bringing up objectives or, or obstacles in the way of your main character because of something that happens by your supporting character, well, that gives you some kind of characterizational strife between them as well. It doesn't have to be big. Just the small things can even help. It builds on the development on the character because if they're having to go through the subplot, they're learning things like house that move into the main plot. It intensifies the conflicts between characters because if your, sub if your supporting character has just accidentally screwed you over and now you can't do the main plot, you're going to be pissed. And this is going to be affecting the story and reflected in the story. And more importantly, they create intrigue and tension in the story. Because if you've got more supporting characters doing things in the story, you can go off in different directions. You can try new things. And if you're a pantser, like I am, it's brilliant. Because you can go off in five different directions and work out which one works. And if one of them does and the others don't, well, when you do your editing, you can make it look like you're God. Mirror subplots. Mirror subplots are a smaller, cell, a, a smaller scale conflict which mirrors the main one. So you might find, for example, uh, th th there's another thing going on at the same time, and they, they see through watching this how to resolve their own conflict. Uh, conflict. So house, it's a mirror thing. If you've got an illness here that you can't fix, there's an illness there he can, the answer there will mirror this and give him the clue he needs. But at the same time, you have a conflicting subplot. This is a secondary supporting character, has the same conflict as the main one, so maybe that could have happened in the first one as well, but whereas in, say, a mirror subplot, your main character is watching his supporting character doing the same thing but in a smaller level, and he succeeds, and that gives your main character a chance of going, ah, that's what I need to do. In a contrasting one, they go the wrong way. They do something and fail, ex blow something up or whatever, which means your main character then realizes, don't do that. Do something else. Go the other way. <coughs> Expository subplots. This is a subplot that shows the cause and effect of something that occurs in the main story or to the main characters. Again, it's that kind of quest story. If your character is doing two or three things, they might have to go off to find some information that will help them with the quest. Finding that information, one, gives you a nice little action-adventure side plot, but also gives you something you can tell the readers about the story. Complication subplot. This is where a supporting character, the antagonist, or even a minor character uh, makes matters worse for the main character, either accidentally or on, or on purpose. I hate this subplot. I hate stories where this happens. I find these very awkward, where, you know, these are quite uh, common in a lot of comedies where there's like a, the hangover, for example. Uh, you know, there's Zach yes, this is character, who I don't know how to pronounce his surname, I'm British, but his, his character deliberately causes strife every time he turns up in a scene, and I can't, it grates my teeth. But there are people out there who absolutely love that kind of subplot. It's still a subplot you can use. If you can have something where a main character or a sub-character makes matters worse by doing something bad, well, now you've got to explain how they get out of that. 
which gives you more pages, which gives you more story, which gives you more interest. Romance subplot. The main character has a, uh, a romantic complication with a secondary character, altering the main narrative drive in the process of resolution. This is quite a mainstay in film and TVs. You know, oh my God, I hate that woman, half an hour later. Oh my God, I love that woman. It's common as hell, especially in action movies where you have to save the cat really fast. I like to use speed as an option for this one. Speed is a very good film. It's lots of things happening one after the other, but there's no way in hell Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves would have got together so quickly. She drove a bus for half an hour. That was pretty much all she does. But by the end, they're like, oh my gosh, you're the best thing ever. But within a day, she's off with Jason Patrick on a boat. So. And then you have the unconnected. Oh, was that, was that too soon? And then you have the unconnected subplot. Two stories run in tandem, never truly crossing until the end when they become inseparable from each other. This is a subplot and a line that can also change uh, other things. So, for example, The Witcher, uh, when you watch season one of The Witcher, uh, has the timing where you've got three scenes going along, but they're all in different times. First season of Westworld did this amazingly. It's only about two-thirds of the way through that you realize that two of the main threads aren't happening simultaneously. They're happening 30 years apart from each other. And then those stories converge. But it doesn't have to be temporal. It doesn't have to be time-related. It can be just kind of, you know, just fun. You could just literally have it that there's an amusing side plot that by the time they get to the end is actually relevant. Or it could be something transitional like sliding doors, where you've got two completely separate multiversal lives that merge together or start and tangent away from each other. But the most important thing I can ever teach somebody about subplots is that your audience is better at subplots than you are. And they do not want to be spoon-fed your subplot. They don't want to be spoon-fed the story. If they're reading your book, they don't want you to turn around to them and tell them that 2 plus 3 equals 5. Because then they're feeling like they're being lectured. What they want is you to tell them that 2 plus something equals 5. Because then, subconsciously, they go, 3. It's 3. And they feel that they are part of the story. And again, this is a sales technique. Um, Salespeople, when they're selling things, will often turn around, if they're, if they're selling an advert, for example, to a, a car store, and they're saying, oh, we're going to have a jingle. What kind of music would you like in your jingle? Oh, I like rock music. Right, so we could do like a rock music and do this. And already, that customer is involved in the creation of that jingle, which means they're now interested in the advert. And it's the same with subplots and audiences. If the audience I think that they're slightly cleverer than you, and they're half a step ahead of you, when they're actually half a step behind you, then you can work that to your advantage. and You can make that audience believe they are knowing exactly what's going on to the point where they realize they don't. But that also leads into things like Chekhov's gun. Now, I talk about this tomorrow, so I'm not going to go too much into this now, but Chekhov's gun is brilliant for subplots. Chekhov's gun is basically Anton Chekhov, a playwright, said, if you say in the first act of a play that there's a, like a rifle or a gun hanging on the wall, by the end of that play, it has to go off. Because if you don't use it, it's no point having it. And Chekhov's gun is very important because when you're writing backwards, or if you've got your moment, your exciting moment, and you're trying to work out what can lead to it, throwing in your Chekhov's guns, pretty much Chekhov's grenades at this point, gives you ways to create new subplots, gives you ways to create new supporting characters because you're working backwards. You have the hindsight of what's going to happen, so you know that you need to get them to this position, uh, particular place. And if you know to get them to that place, then you can start having these separate subplots here. Or a supporting character turns them and does a particular thing, because you already know the route that you're laying them to. And if you're doing that, well, then this part of your story becomes so much more easy. I mean, apart from the fact that I don't think anybody here uses a typewriter anymore, and you're not throwing paper. I mean, I particularly like to just grab paper and throw it anyway. But when you're writing a story, if you can work out your subplots, if you can work out supporting characters, if you can work backwards from that moment and know what their characters are doing, that's 90% of your story done. Because people read characters. I write crime, and I can tell you now without a single doubt that of the God knows how many people who have read my books, you know, thousands of people who have read my books, a handful of them give a shit about the crime. They care about the characters. 
I know this because they send me messages about the characters. Oh, DCI Monroe almost got into trouble this time. Can't wait to see what happens next. I made a joke in one of the things that I was going to kill off one of my characters. I had a, a revolt on my Facebook page. You can't kill them off. Whatever you do, don't kill him off. People love these characters. That's all they care about. So if you are building up your supporting characters, you're making your job easier. And that is it. Now, I believe we have five minutes. Five minutes for questions. There's a, uh, a, a thing just there, a microphone, that's what they're called. Yes, hello. hello. It is on, it is on. Is it on? Okay. Um, how do you keep your, your subplots from getting out of control? I'm a discovery writer, so they just, one subplot will spawn another subplot. Every time I have conflict, I add more subplots in it. I have a book. Have you got to the point yet where you have to have a separate notebook to write all your subplots in? Have you got to the point where you have a separate notebook to write all your subplots in? No, I... Oh, you're fine then. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just asking. My, my last book I had to split because I ended up having so many subplots. It was like too much plot for one book. I completely get that. Yeah. Um, it's trial and error. You know now that you had too many subplots. So now you have a situation where you can... Do you have beta readers or people like that who will read your books for you? Yeah. Right. Make a point of saying to them and saying, look, this book had too many. If this is going over that, you need to let me know. Because we forget, we go word blind. We just think it's the best book in the world ever. And then when they say, this is shit, you get really annoyed. But they will be able to look at it far more uh, impassionately than you would. And most people like subplots. And you can have subplots that go off on one, but take multiple books to finish. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem at all. It's more about the resolution of your subplots. You can throw out a ton of um, what's called pocket pistols. This is where, you know, in a scene, there's a, at the start of the scene, you see a banana skin is on the floor. You know by the end, someone's going to fall on it. You can have tons of those. Just don't make them that they last the entire book, and you should be fine. But mainly, ask other people who are reading your book, because they are your best judge. Yes. Yeah, great presentation so far. Um, the readers read character over plot, so how do you, what's your take on the kill your darlings thing? Um, yeah, it's difficult because you have to decide whether you want to actually do the book you want to do or whether you want to make money because, and it's a similar thing, Conan Doyle killed Sherlock Holmes off and people were so pissed off he had to bring him back and go, ha ha, surprise, it was all a dream with Bobby Ewing. And there's an element that you have to decide yourself what you want to do. Uh, in my series, I recently removed a main character from the, the team, but I had to look at the list of characters and work out who's the one people wouldn't give a shit about the most, because you kind of have to do that. But sometimes to do that will give you that momentous point that brings them into it. You will lose people, absolutely, because I know people who watch film and TV and everything who are pissed off because they've lost their favorite character. But at the same time, they will still watch the show if they're a fan of the show. They'll still read the books if they're a fan of the books. And if that person walks away from your story because they only liked that character, then there's an argument to say they weren't the biggest fan of your stories. They were only there for one person. And if that's the case, write another character just like them and put them in a different book, and they'll read that book. Yes. Hi, Tony. Thanks for the presentation. Really terrific. Uh, addressing your views on cliche overuse. Yes. I think you warned against it at least five times in your slides, but they're almost essential. You know, the chosen one, the love triangle, the murder present in the first scene of a crime novel. H how do you avoid that? <sighs> yeah. Um, the problem is, is the trope is an amazing thing because a trope is something that goes, oh, do not do this. But at the same time, you have to. You know, you know for a fact that the moment someone brings out a big shiny red button and says don't press it, you're going to have to press it. You know, do not cross the streams where well, you're going to have to cross the streams. It's as simple as that. Tropes, they're not rules, they're guidelines. You can use any trope. I mean, I said here, don't use cliches, but I've read books where the characters are cliched and I've loved every second of them. You know, I've read books where the characters aren't cliched and I've been bored shitless. You know, there's, you, everything I've said today is a guideline, it's not a rule. Take what you want, throw away what you don't want. It's the same with every single talk here. And with cliches, it's a tough one, but if you're writing a genre where the cliches rule, then you have to lean into that. And I think if you're writing to any kind of market, you'll learn very quickly what the market is that you have to write to. And so, yeah, so things like Chosen Hero and stuff like that, 
there's a lot of things your audience will expect. They will want this particular scene, and you have to put it in, even though it's a trope. And all I would say is lean into it, but do it reluctantly, if that helps. Um, I've got 50 seconds left. Any last questions? No? Awesome. In that case, I'm just going to rapidly plug uh, the fact that tomorrow morning, at an ungodly time, I'm going to be here talking about Chekhov's gun and how working backwards uh, helps you work forwards. If you've got any questions, because obviously I'm, I've talked a lot, come find me all week. I'm literally around. I will answer any questions, give any advice I can possibly give. You've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Have a good day.